I've been writing this blog for nearly 17 years. From nearly the beginning, learning was a central theme. And part of that was, as a college student, how to study was pretty much the only topic I could credibly offer advice on. Now, the disadvantage of such an early start is that my naive opinions are now encased in the amber of my archives. Some of my early ideas were just outright bad, but more often they contained a complicated mix of useful ideas and maybe sometimes unhelpful suggestions. So in this recording, I'd like to make explicit some of the ways I've changed my thinking over the last 17 years. Not to undo my past writing or to claim that my current views are somehow final, but to try to explain why I changed my mind about some of the things that I believed in the past. My early views. Holistic learning and learn more, study less. My first popular writing came from an observation that successful students seem to deeply understand subjects by linking them together, while less successful students attempt to memorize things by rote. I called this successful strategy holistic learning, and my earliest work was centered around it. Now, none of this writing was grounded in serious research. That isn't to say that all opinions need a citation to be valuable, but simply that I just wasn't basing any of my thoughts on a careful review of the scientific literature. Instead, I derived most of my advice from personal experience and from reading other popular advice. Now, 17 years later, having read a lot more research, I often see some subtle parallels to my early thinking. My focus on the associative character of memory has parallels in spreading activation models of declarative memory. Uh, my idea about mental constructs is very similar to schema theory, and mental models have inspired considerable research, and they were a big presence in my early writing, even though I relied on none of that when I was giving my advice in those days. Now, the philosophy I espoused was essentially a version of constructivism, the idea that students construct meaning and ground understanding of abstract ideas in prior knowledge. In this view, it's the active effort of the student in creating an understanding that leads to learning, an effort that is often stifled by drills and memorization. What I got wrong in my early thinking. So some central pieces of advice I gave during this period included, you should avoid memorizing ideas instead seeking to understand them. Concepts can be understood through analogies, mental pictures and diagrams, and connecting ideas together is the central activity of learning things. Now, none of these are exactly false, but I wouldn't make any of them central in the advice I give today. Instead, they all suffer from some problems. First, memorizing is often a necessary step to learning complex ideas. Understanding is better, but understanding is built out of memory, rather than being opposed to it. Second, analogies are great learning tools, but they suffer from a bootstrapping problem. It's hard to notice analogies unless you already have an abstract mental representation of the deep structure of an idea. When you lack that, attempts to make analogies often result in superficial mnemonics or buggy concepts that can actually mislead you. As a result, I now typically advocate people make metaphors and analogies and diagrams and images when they are ready, but to focus on directly understanding an idea first, through close reading and seeking more explanations. Declarative memory is associative, and so making connections is a central activity for learning. However, just making any old connections is probably not the most efficient way to learn something deeply. Instead, seeing lots of examples and getting lots of practice questions is probably a better and more efficient way of making those connections, while avoiding some of the extraneous misapplications of ideas. Overall, the worst piece of advice I gave during this period was discouraging repetitive practice in favor of just associative memory like mnemonics. My view on this is basically the opposite now. I believe that associative strategies like mnemonics should be supplementary to retrieval practice such as flashcards rather than the reverse. Practice questions should be the cornerstone of studying, not a crutch to be avoided. Now, while it's been interesting to see some of my initial intuitions mirrored vaguely in learning research, say gestalt psychology or constructivist education, I don't think I can take too much credit for this. Instead, I think I based my intuitions around learning on the same intuitions that inspired more serious research, as well as the cultural zeitgeist that also made my early writing popular. What I missed was that the process good students use is essentially what everyone does when you learn subjects that you find easy. When you're learning things that are hard, and understanding doesn't come easily, practice and memorization are not things to be avoided, but important building blocks towards deeper understanding. Maturing thoughts. 
learning projects, and ultra learning. So after college, I embarked on a series of learning challenges, MIT's computer science curriculum, multiple languages, art, and more. And these culminated in my 2019 book, Ultra Learning. While the full span of this period covers nearly a decade, and thus my thinking during the MIT challenge was quite different from when I had finished the research for Ultra Learning, some consistent themes emerged throughout this time. One is the importance of practice. So unlike the conceptual understanding that was central to my undergraduate education, the cornerstone of my learning efforts in this period was practice, practice, practice. During the MIT challenge, I found practice problems to be the most effective tool for preparing for difficult exams. In my language learning travels, I spent nearly all of my time practicing through conversation, flashcards, grammar textbooks. With portrait drawing, I based my model of learning almost entirely on repetitive practice, to such an extent that I even neglected finding good methods till about halfway through the project. This emphasis on practice reflected the research I did in ultra learning. I wrote chapters on directness, drawing on the robust literature showing that people frequently fail to transfer skills to new areas, drill inspired by the work on deliberate practice showing that effortful targeted efforts at improvement are essential and retrieval built on the robust literature showing that memory strengthens more from recall than review mistakes made in my maturing thoughts now here i think my track record is much better than my early thinking if i had to go back and edit ultra learning again there's not so much i would have to rewrite However, I think my focus on self-directed learning blinded me somewhat to some of the distinct challenges that it poses. For one, I emphasized practice and de-emphasized seeing examples and explanations. And part of this was simply that because the student has much less control over the latter. Some classes have tons of practice problems with worked out solutions and some have almost none. Students in general don't have much choice over which they have to take. Second, following my interest in deliberate practice, I tended to view harder learning as more efficient learning. A cornerstone of the argument in ultra learning was that greater efficiency came from more difficult and strenuous efforts. Now, this is a view not without some support. Robert Bjork's work on desirable difficulties, retrieval practice, and others all lend some suggestions to the idea that students tend to slack off for their own detriment. But while practice is good, Examples are too. Watching other people perform a skill, especially explanations for why they made the decisions they did, is central to learning well. Similarly, while effortful practice is often necessary, not all effort is useful. I now believe a lot of students' struggles are simply wasteful. Failures of instructors to provide thorough examples and explanations rather than a sign that deeper learning is taking place. Recent adjustments, direct instruction, and cognitive science. So, since writing Ultra Learning, I've delved far deeper into the science of learning. I collaborated with cognitive science PhD student Jakob Yulik on a number of research-based guides for long-term memory, working memory, and self-control. And afterwards, I also did a solo research project into the science of motivation. More recently, I've done a wide-ranging project that's exposed me to the main currents in educational and cognitive psychology. And through this effort, I now feel fairly well-versed in the history of different theories, current controversies, and the main arguments and research used to support different opinions. I'm far from an expert, but I know a lot more than I used to. And reading this literature has made me more supportive of direct instruction for learning. This is a philosophy of learning that involves breaking down complex skills into simple concepts and actions, teaching with tons of examples, and ample practice. Critics often accuse it of being mindless, much like I criticized rote learning in my early days, but I now see this as its strength. When learning can occur without requiring special cleverness, far more students will benefit, not just the smartest. I now believe that practice difficulty comes in different flavors. Some of the difficulty is due to retrieval. You don't know which knowledge to bring to bear on a problem. And in this case, the research seems to support the idea that modest difficulty is better. We want problems easy enough that we can typically be successful, but not so easy that we become reliant on hints. Other kinds of difficulty, however, are probably wasteful. Seeing good examples and explanations appears to involve different learning processes than learning by doing. The latter can not only be frustrating and slow, but lead to improper generalization of skills as well. For the majority of skills, it definitely seems like a lack of good examples is a greater bottleneck to learning than the over-reliance on easy practice. 
Similarly, I now view issues of practice realism in a different light. For skills that are of low to moderate of cognitive load, it's realistic practice that will be more efficient. But for high cognitive load skills, like typical classroom subjects such as math, programming, or grammar in a foreign language, realism can make things harder to grasp. In that case, it's probably better to work through the textbook exercises of the classroom rather than just trying to do things in practice. With so many changes, why bother listening to me? I'm not an expert. Now, part of this admission is still that I have large gaps in my knowledge that I'm trying to fill, but part of it is also that expertise is a social label. Belonging to that social category would require a career change I'm not particularly interested in making right now. So given my lack of expertise and my frank admission that my views have changed over time, it might be worthwhile to ask whether I should be listened to at all. After all, what's the chances are that you're going to turn around 10 years from now and I'm going to just deny everything that I said today? I'm not sure I can give a good justification of my existence in the intellectual marketplace. After all, if you wanted to understand the psychology of learning, you won't do much better than John Anderson's textbook. For memory, there's Alan Badley's. From a neuroscientific perspective, there's Stanislaw Dane. For teaching, there's Daniel Willingham's books and essays. And for expertise, there's the work of Anders Ericsson. I'd trust all of them a lot more than me. However, if I can offer a weak defense of my work, I would say that while my views have changed, the oscillations are increasingly minor. Thus, the transition from my early to mature writing was fairly dramatic. I'd have to completely rewrite Learn More, Study Less to bring it in line with my current thinking. Ultra learning would probably only need a few footnotes. I still believe there's a gap in learning advice that focuses on the learner's perspective. So the vast majority of serious work centers on teachers and educational institutions. This not only gives learning a bit of a scholastic bias that ignores many of the practical interests people have in learning something, but it also makes it harder to connect this work with the perspective of students. While popular works like Peak, Make It Stick, and Learning How to Learn often offer translations of the research, the majority of educational research centers on educators, not learners themselves, and thus we're often left out in the middle of the cold to try to figure out what's the best way to learn. Finally, I try to offer encouragement, not scholarship. So while ultimately I'm responsible for the quality of the advice I offer and I try to do my best there, I'd like to think that the projects I've done or the attitudes I've tried to advocate have had at least as important an impact in encouraging people to learn as much as they try to convey any important serious research findings. But ultimately, the justification for my work is you. For some reason, people have stuck around reading this blog, listening to this YouTube channel, or listening to this podcast, and despite it being a continual work in progress. Few people get to make a career out of learning things, and for that, I owe everyone who listens to me a debt of gratitude.